My beginnings with the Pikmin series is actually kind of funny. It all started with Super Smash Bros. Brawl. For whatever reason, Olimar was such a cool character to me. He summons little plant people to do his bidding for him. They are all so cute and are very dependable creatures. The five different types all have different strengths, colors, and characteristics. Olimar was my main in Brawl, and this carried through it on Smash 4, Ultimate, and even fan mods like PM. I vividly remember having a stupid cheat code book back in the day. I don't remember which edition exactly, but it had Pikmin 2 in it. The cheat codes were nothing more than just dumb shit, like press this button and have an iridescent flint beetle go across the title screen. But for whatever reason, this is what pushed me over the edge. I needed Pikmin 2. That was all that my 5th grader brain could think of. I NEEDED Pikmin 2. Sure enough, Christmas comes around and Santa leaves me Pikmin 2 underneath the tree. Except it wasn't. It was the original Pikmin in a blockbuster case that said Pikmin 2 on it. I wasn't even disappointed. I just marched right over to the GameCube, popped in Pikmin, and played it over, and over, and over again. A week later, my mom told me that I had to return Pikmin. Because again, this was from Blockbuster. She assured me that we'll get a hold of Pikmin 2 somehow. I can't remember what day it was exactly, but I remember I was homesick from school one day. A package was delivered to the house and it looked like a game. Or maybe two? That's right, my mom bought me not just Pikmin 2, but she made sure the original Pikmin was included as well. And here we are now, almost 15 years later. And I can say with full certainty that Pikmin is one of my favorite games of all time, as well as one of my most replayed games of all time. I will now talk about why I love the original Pikmin. I'll talk about what makes it so much fun, what makes it so replayable. And to make sure I don't get too giddy, I'll talk about its faults as well. If you truly love something, you'll pick up on things you don't love too, you know what I mean? Let's start with the story, shall we? Olar is cruising through outer space one day. At least according to the manual, he's getting himself a cup of tea, so he sent the SS Dolphin on autopilot. This was a mistake, as a meteor hits the SS Dolphin and sends Olimar right down to a distant planet. Luckily, he recovers, but he notices that his ship is missing 30 pieces. On top of that, oxygen is very dangerous to Hulkatations, and he only has 30 days to live. With no other choice, he decides to explore the area. He comes across a red machine of sorts that he decides to call an onion. The onion spits out a little red seed. Olimar gathers the courage to pluck the seed, which reveals a little plant-like creature. Creature. Thankfully, the creature wasn't harmful. In fact, the creature was happy to follow Olimar around. Through the use of pellets, Olimar figured out that the onion can breed Pikmin when items are brought to it. Speaking of that, Olimar cannot carry objects himself, the Pikmin have to do it for him. After breeding 10 Pikmin, Olimar commands them to push a box. This makes Olimar realize even though the Pikmin are individually small, they can conquer great tasks when work together. Right behind the box is the main engine. This will require 20 Pikmin to lift, which the player can breed 25 if they find all the pellets. After returning the main engine to the SS Dolphin, Olimar will be able to take off for the night. Then he can set his sights on the Forest of Hope, the Forest Naval, the Distant Spring, and the Final Trial. The game has three endings. The best ending will occur if the player can get all 30 ship parts before the 30 days are up. This will have Olimar waving goodbye to the Pikmin as they will all look at him as he takes off. A Bulbor will walk by and the Pikmin will start to attack it. This indicates that the Pikmin have learned to fend for themselves after spending time with Olimar. Keep in mind, each of the three onions that Olimar finds, they are more or less out of commission and they all shoot out just a single seat. It is up to Olimar to up the Pikmin's numbers. The enemy reel will also play after the credits. The average ending is obtained if the player grabs the 25 necessary ship parts, but not all 30. This will have Olimar hastily leaving the Pikmin. There are no goodbyes or anything. A single red, blue, and yellow Pikmin just look up as Olimar takes off. There isn't much more to say about this ending. It feels pretty empty. Sure, Olimar survived, but without any fanfare. At least it's better than the bad ending, I guess. If the player doesn't get the 25 necessary ship parts, Olimar will still try to leave, of course. The beginning of it is very similar to the average ending. Olimar will take off, and the three Pikmin will look at him, but he will fail. The ship will come crashing down. The Pikmin will find his unconscious body and take it to the Onion. The Onion will shoot out a weird Olimar Pikmin hybrid thing. Since Pikmin can't pluck sprouts themselves, I guess Olimar just stays there until he dies? This ending is pretty brutal and dark for a kid's game. We're not done there regarding the story, though. The original Pikmin easily has the best story in the series, full stop. Olimar's daily ship log adds to the story in such meaningful ways. Some of them will talk about how much he misses his family, how doomed he feels, and him wondering if he'll ever get back to Hokitate. On the flip side, though, some of them are actually encouraging. I remember one in particular where Olimar mentions that he will push forward with a new attitude. The ship log entries are just so atmospheric. If you want a complete list of them, head on over to Pikipedia. According to it, there are 71 entries total, but this does include some scrapped ones. I just love the whole fight for your life story. While Pikmin 3's story technically has much higher stakes, it's harder to feel that when you're actually playing the game. Meanwhile, in Pikmin 1, you are constantly reminded that you need to hurry your ass to save Olimar. The ship parts, the main collectibles of the game, are very important to the story. Leaving one behind, it may kill Olimar. Yeah, there are five optional ship parts, but a first-time player, they're not going to know which ones they are. Pikmin's story is brief. 
but it's one of my favorites in gaming. It takes a Nintendo approach of being short, but giving the player more than enough to get going. With the story done, let's talk about general gameplay. The player will take control of Olimar, who comes from Hokitate. Olimar can command up to 100 plant-like creatures named Pikmin. While these creatures are individually weak, they are forced to be reckoned with once they team up. Pikmin can carry objects, push boxes, break down walls, attack enemies, build bridges. They do a lot. Olimar can do very little on his own, so he needs the Pikmin to do... Anything, really. Olimar can throw the Pikmin to higher places. This can be helpful in combat, but some ship parts are also up high. After being thrown, Pikmin will go into an idle state. When in an idle state, the Pikmin will turn gray. They also attack enemies, pick up objects, or interact with anything else that is close to them. Idle Pikmin can be called with the whistle to join Olimar's group. If the player tilts the sea stick in any direction, they'll start swarming. When swarming, the Pikmin will follow the direction of the sea stick. They will carry objects, attack enemies, and interact with anything else that's in their way. Swarming can be very useful in navigating tight areas. The swarm feature also makes amazing music. Pikmin at three maturity stages. Leaf, Bud, and Flower. Leaf Pikmin are slow as hell and Flower Pikmin are super fast. Flower Pikmin may also drop a seedling in combat that will sprout the next day. Speaking of combat, a Flower Pikmin may turn into a Bud Pikmin if shaken off by an enemy. There are two ways to turn a Bud and Leaf Pikmin into a Flower Pikmin. Either by blobs of nectar or by leaving them in the ground long enough. Since this game is all about time, the swiftness of the Flower Pikmin may prove to be very useful. The extra speed that they get can be the difference between the Pikmin returning the last ship out or not in the dying seconds of the day. There are three different types of Pikmin and they all have two abilities. Red Pikmin are resistant to fire and use their sharp noses to do 1.5 damage. Yellow Pikmin can be thrown higher than other Pikmin as well as use bomb rocks to attack enemies and destroy walls. Blue Pikmin can go into the water with no worries and they can save drowning Pikmin. Since there are only three Pikmin, this may be a given, but I think that the Pikmin balancing is actually pretty good in this game and it's easily the best in the series. I find myself using all three Pikmin types a decent bit. Well, if you want to get tactical, there are Mushroom Pikmin and Pikmar. But I mean, come on. As shown in the Day 1 tutorial, Pikmin can carry pellets back to the Onion to make more Pikmin. There are two things to note about this. If the pellet matches the same color as the Onion it goes to, more Pikmin will be produced. Enemies can be taken back to the Onion as well. This is such a fun part of Pikmin. Killing enemies and carrying their corpses back to get more Pikmin? It's just addicting watching those numbers go up. The Onion will plant the Pikmin in the ground if there aren't already 100 Pikmin on the field. If there are already 100 Pikmin on the field, the game will automatically store the new Pikmin in the Onion. Each Pikmin type has its own Onion and they can be called upon by standing in the light. One last thing to mention is the disbanding feature. Pikmin can be disbanded by color and this is very helpful. For example, you come across some water, you're gonna want to disband all Pikmin types and take the blue Pikmin with you. Yellow Pikmin carrying bomb rocks will be separated into their own group, which is appreciated. As I mentioned earlier, Olimar really cannot do much on his own, but there are a few things that are worth mentioning. He can obviously throw Pikmin higher, use his whistle, disband them, but if you're talking solo Olimar, there really is not much. Olimar is a pitiful punch that does almost no damage. It can be used to destroy the armor cannon beetles boulders though, so that's pretty cool. The player is going to want to keep an eye on Olimar's health meter. If this hits zero, the day will automatically end and any Pikmin not near the onions will perish. Luckily, the player can heal themselves if they interact with a dolphin at pretty much any time. The other thing that Olimar can do is lie down. I'm surprised that so many people write this off as being useless. This prevents Olimar from taking damage. It can be incredibly useful to lie down next to an enemy to distract them from Pikmin carrying stuff. I swear, even some Pikmin veterans don't know this. The Pikmin can also carry Olimar, which can help if the player is lost, I guess? I mean, the stages are all pretty small, you get the map of the stages early, but I guess it's worth noting. Olimar can also bump items in the state, which can be helpful for getting some of them out of the water. If the Pikmin carries Olimar to the Onion, fireworks will come out of it. It's cute for sure, but I don't think this has any practicality. Days are 13 and a half minutes. The in-game reasoning for this is just so perfect. At nighttime, enemies will flood the stage so Olimar decides that it's time to just leave. If any Pikmin are either not following Olimar or idle at the base, they will perish to the creatures. In the GameCube version, you cannot skip the end of day cutscene, so you have to watch your mistake in real time. I love this. It's so dark and you wouldn't expect this out of a Nintendo game. The way that the game counts down from 10 just makes it so hectic. If there's even a single Pikmin across the map, I will make sure that they survive. Even if it means wasting my last 30 seconds of the day or so. It also forces the player to come up with a plan and figure out how to execute it in the allocated time. I get such an adrenaline rush when I have a good day and collect five or six ship parts. There's just something so good about seeing your plan work out. It is so satisfying. Combat is pretty simple in Pikmin, but there are a few wrinkles that keep it interesting. The three main methods of attacking are either throwing, swarming, or disbanding near an enemy. Throwing is better for flying enemies, or ones that are higher up. Some of them, like BD Longlegs, will be easier to take down with the yellow Pikmin because of their throw height. Some enemies, like the Dwarf Bulb Orb and Shear Grubs, will have a sweet spot on their back. If the player can hit this sweet spot, the creature will die immediately, or take a lot of damage. Some enemies, like the Spotty Bulb Orbs, can be taken down in a second or two by swarming. Nothing feels better than getting a perfect swarm on a bull bear and losing no Pikmin in the process. There is some risk-reward here, as shit can go very wrong if you can't take it out quickly. Most enemies will eat Pikmin as a way of attacking, but some will squish Pikmin, 
use hazards like water or fire, or simply try to lure them away. If Pikmin are shaken off by an enemy, they may lose their flowers. I like this because it has a sense of consequences in battles where Pikmin can't die. For example, you could easily kill a fiery blowhog and no losses by just using red Pikmin. However, if one gets careless, this fight can still be a pain in the ass. The fiery blowhog is a cycle of blowing out fire and shaking off Pikmin that are attacking it. This will encourage players to learn the admittedly simple enemy attacking patterns. Leave Pikmin suck, man. Want to get flower Pikmin? Leave Pikmin become a huge nuisance. With all the general gameplay out of the way, I want to tackle each of the five stages. I'll take note of what shit parts are scattered here, what enemies you can fight, and the overall layout. I guess I'll start with the impact site. The impact site is the game's tutorial stage. The first day is more or less going to be the same for everyone. You gotta grow at least 20 red Pikmin and return the games for a shit part, the main engine. This will enable Omar to lift off at the end of the day. The rest of the stage is blocked off by a stone wall. Even if you could get this wall down, you'll notice that the second ship part is located in a body of water. So there's no point in returning here until you have the yellow and blue Pikmin. Maybe unless an accident happens and you kill all your Pikmin at some point, the impact site is great for breeding more Pikmin due to all of its pellets and the low number of enemies. If the player breaks the rock wall, they'll come across three pearly clam clams. To kill them, you just have to throw Pikmin inside of them and attack their pearls. After a few seconds though, it snaps down, eating any Pikmin that are left in there. If one has a slow reaction time, these guys are a huge problem. Luckily, one of these guys is located on land instead of water. I usually just end up using spare bomb rocks to take it out. The pearls will give the player 50 Pikmin, again leading to the fact that the impact site is the best place to farm Pikmin. One of those pearly clan clams is holding the Positron Generator. When approached, Omar will state, I found the Positron Generator. By combining its batteries with solar cells, this machine can generate incredible amounts of electricity. What a timely find. Those instant space noodles will taste better when heated up. This electric generator is so powerful that you approach it carelessly, you'll get an electric shock. Starting on day 8, the Mamuda and Gulix can be found on the tree stump. The Mamuda will be found on even days and the Gulix on odd days. The Mamuda will plant Pikmin in the ground, but at least they become flower Pikmin. Plucking them all is still a pain in the ass though. The Gulix is much more interesting. It's a giant water creature that will suffocate any Pikmin that aren't blue Pikmin with water. Fun fact! This is the only enemy in the game to use water to attack Pikmin. It can be hurt by attacking its nucleus. All that it can really do is shake off blue Pikmin getting rid of their flowers. I'm pretty sure it can't kill them in any way. There are a few other enemies here. If you want to count the iridescent flint beetle, there are three of them. The stage is very small and is really little more than a tutorial stage, with an extra strip part thrown in there for good measure. There is one 20 pallet for each color of Pikmin that are scattered across the stage. There's also a 10 pallet for each color too, and they are held on top of this stump. The Pikmin get it up by attacking this bundle of sticks. Omar can get up after the Pikmin attack the geyser. I've always liked the musical track here too. It just screams Pikmin to me, you know? I like it as a tutorial stage, but I can understand why others may think that there's just not enough going on. I'd be remiss to not mention what Omar says when finding the main engine. Omar will state, Amazing! There's no mistaking it. My ship's engine rests before my very eyes. By a stroke of pure luck, I have already stumbled upon the most important piece of my damaged craft. Fate has smiled upon me. But... How do I get this back to the dolphin? It was pure luck that I found this piece first. With this, I can at least lift off. I'll be upfront here. The Force of Hope may be my favorite musical track ever recorded for a video game. It's so uplifting and the name of the stage just reflects that. After somehow lifting off for the night, Omar can find an additional 8 ship parts here. The game will drop you down inside a closed space. The game does a great job with wordless tutorials. It is instinctual to knock down this wall. Especially today, it just feels like tutorials are way too long-winded and wordy. If the game was released today, you bet your ass the game would have halted everything and made sure that you knocked down this wall. There's also a nectar weed plant to mess around with inside the base. One thing that I love about the Force of Hope is that it displays who the hardcore players are. Did you know that you could collect every ship part in a single day? I'm not shitting you. Just look up Pikmin 6 Day Run the Force of Hope, or something to that effect. People have found a way to get all 8 ship parts without blue Pikmin, even though there's water. This is even more impressive because Omar discovers yellow Pikmin here, and he has to grow a decent bit of them. Some of these strats are just straight up crazy. Like, they will basically drown Pikmin and call them over to the bridge with the Sagittarius. They'll throw a bomb rack Pikmin on this gate in the water to bypass the blue Pikmin requirement. The box of the Snaggers can be pushed by other Pikmin as well. The Force of Hope displays one of my favorite things about Pikmin. The skill floor is low. Getting a ship part a day to make sure Omar doesn't die? That's not too hard. But the skill ceiling is absurd. Yeah, Pikmin's easy, but have you done a six-day run? The way that speedrunners and six-day runners handle Pikmin just mesmerizes me. Anyway, the Eternal Fuel Dynamo is right outside of the starting area. Omar will stay. Why? It's the Eternal Fuel Dynamo. It has unlimited energy supply. I won't have to worry about saving electricity anymore. This will make my fight for survival a bit easier. This should light things up. No more candles for me. If the player marches a bit further, they'll come into contact with spotty bulborbs. They're actually pretty brutal in this game if one doesn't know how to handle them correctly. The best method is to swarm them with a large group of Pikmin. The Pikmin will usually do enough damage to kill it before it can react. 
If the bulb starts biting, things can get hairy as they take less damage when doing this. To make matters worse, many of them are surrounded by dwarf bulb orbs. These guys may shriek when provoked, which will wake up a nearby parent. If the player proceeds a bit further, they'll find the yellow onion. They can sprout more yellow Pikmin, which get plenty of use in this stage. Yellow Pikmin can use bomb rocks to break down reinforced walls and kill annoying enemies. Just beyond the onion is a whimsical radar. This ship part is cool because it's the only one to affect gameplay in some way. After returning into the ship, the player can use the radar. This will show them the entire area, as well as their current position, stray Pikmin, as well as other ship parts. Olimar will say, It's my whimsical radar. With this, I'll be able to see all nearby ship parts in a single glance. I just press Y to check it. This find fills me with great hope. This important part can detect the locations of other missing parts. The radar will be added to my monitor, which I can just press Y to view. Z zooms it in and out. This will surely help me in my search for the remaining parts. Several shear grubs will reside near the whimsical radar. These guys can be a huge pain. Once they bite down on a Pikmin, they become really hard to kill. They go into an impervious state. You can save the Pikmin by throwing the Pikmin right onto its back, but this can be really hard to do in tense situations. The female shear grubs won't attack, only the male ones. Right behind these guys and gals is a dark reinforced wall that will take nine bomb rocks to destroy. Destroying him will reveal the extraordinary bolt. Omar will state, it's the extraordinary bolt! I bought this incredible bolt because the salesman told me that it is of extraordinary quality that is indiscernible to the average person. Exactly what makes it so extraordinary is a secret, but just look at it! Extraordinary! This bolt's bolt holds the kind of value that only a true connoisseur can understand. If the player pushes further, they can loop back to the beginning area if they have enough bomb rocks to break down the reinforced wall. I love the decision making here. You can either destroy the wall to get back to the base more quickly, you can save the bomb rocks with a dark bramble wall, or you can just save them to kill enemies. Decisions, decisions. Beyond the dark bramble wall are two dwarf bulb orbs as well as a spotty bulb orb. The Nova Blaster also resides here. Olimar states, I found the Nova Blaster! This emits a dazzling burst of light capable of destroying almost anything. I'm not exactly sure about this, but the promotional brochure claims that its blast can travel in currents of space-time, smashing through stars and into rifts of space. This is a weapon of such incredible destructive force that can blast stars into tiny pieces. It has such a strange allure. The last ship out of the devs intended for the player to get without blue Pikmin is the Shock Absorber. This can be obtained by going to the left of the starting room. The player can throw Pikmin up on a ledge and get there by going through this patch of water. A spotty bulb orb is sleeping by it. You should either kill it or distract it because the Pikmin Pikmin carrying the part, they will go right into it. All the Marvel State, it's the Shock Absorber! This apparatus counteracts the shaking and swaying that normally occurs during flight. It's smooth sailing with this in place. Usually. This nifty little device counteracts the shaking and swaying experienced in typical space flight. An armored cannon beetle can be found beyond the Dark Bramble Gate behind the White Bramble Gate in the water. The fight is very easy if you know what you're doing. However, this enemy can flat an entire Pikmin squad in no time flat. Omar can throw a Pikmin in its air hole when it's preparing to shoot a boulder. This will make it panic and open up its backside, which the Pikmin can then attack. It's actually pretty easy to one-cycle it. This armored cannon beetle is guarding the radiation canopy. Omar will state, At last, my radiation canopy. This turns the harsh radiation of deep space into soft, infrared rays that are easy on the body. I'll sleep like a baby once I give this back to the ship. I'll have to inspect it later to make sure it hasn't cracked. I'll be in for even more trouble if I have any radiation leaks. If the player breaks down the other reinforced wall by the yellow onion, they'll come across a couple of body and dwarf bulb orbs. A cardboard box surrounded by water will enable you to go forward. I think the devs intended for you to use blue Pikmin, but you really don't need to. Getting a running start before throwing Pikmin will make them go farther. Three burrowing snaggards will come from the ground. These guys are no pushovers, as they all have 2,800 health each. You only need to kill the one furthest back. I swear, I always lose at least a few Pikmin every time I fight these guys. They eat Pikmin so fast, they can nibble a couple and then head underground and they'll automatically die. It just gets so messy fast. You could swarm him when it comes out of the ground, but you've got to be ready for it. You can also chuck Pikmin at its face. When defeated, its body blows up. That's pretty brutal. It'll drop the Geiger counter, and Omar will state, It's the Geiger counter. Every spaceship needs one of these, but I don't actually know what it's for. Every once in a while, it goes wild and lets out a lot of noise, but I never pay much attention to it, so it doesn't do me much good. I really should read that instruction manual one of these days. This noisy gauge is always letting off spontaneous clicks and buzzes. It can be kind of annoying. The last ship part, the Sagittarius, is very easy to get. All that the player will have to do is build two bridges. One of them is across water, so it's intended for blue Pikmin, but as I said before, brave souls have used red Pikmin to complete the bridges. Olimar will state, I found my Sagittarius. My son gave this to me as a present. It brings to mind vision of my son back home on planet Hokitate. Oh, to be back there right now. This was a gift for my son. He must be very worried about me. That's about it for the Forest of Hope. The last thing that I really want to note involves the enemies here. More enemies will show up as the days go along. For example, there are seven spotty bulb orbs for days two through five. However, 
Two more will appear after that. The Shoemi Snitch Bug appears here on day 15. There's a full list on Wikipedia, but I love this. This shows that nature is ever changing, and it serves as a hurry up and move on kind of motivation. The Force of Hope has steep competition with the Force Naval for my favorite stage. This stage is absolutely lovely. There is plenty of fire, water, high places, and stone walls, which ensures that every Pikmin type gets used. Speaking of that, the blue Pikmin are found here. The Force Naval is a cave that is dimly lit by common glow caps. This area is beautiful, damn it. I don't care what Chef Arilla says. As I said before, there is a lot of fire here. A good chunk of this comes from the furry blue hogs. There are six of them occupying the main area of the map, so it's a good idea to go down there with only red Pikmin and destroy them all. They can't kill red Pikmin on their own, but they can shake them off and ruin their flowers. I've been over it before, but leave Pikmin are cringe. Speaking of fire, there are plenty of fire geysers spring around the map as well. There are plenty of walls to destroy and bridges that the player can build. I love this because it gives the player the option of taking longer to make these new paths available, but the Pikmin will be able to carry items back more quickly. The bomb rocks and the stone walls are in tucked away places. One of them is downward and the Pikmin will have to attack a bundle of sticks to make a ladder. The other one is by the gravity jumper. Olimar will say, I found my gravity jumper. By manipulating the forces of gravity, this key component gives me the final boost I need to make the jump to super light speed. Good thing I found it. This anti-gravity device will allow the dolphin to swim gracefully through the sea of stars like a dolphin. May as well get this one out of the way. The number one Ionium jet is in a puddle of water by the Blue Onion. This treasure is clearly supposed to be gathered pretty quickly. This is a good time to note that some of the ship parts will actually appear outside of the ship when collected. I love this! It's so satisfying to see another ship part appear on the SS Dolphin. It gives you a nice visual sense of progression. Anyway, Olimar will say, I found my number one Ionium jet. Unfortunately, this puts out a slightly odoriferous exhaust, but it does propel me to escape velocity in an instant. The stench is a small price to pay for such performance. If this is damaged, I'll be in dire straits. I will have to run a system check as soon as I can. I can see the argument that the automatic gear is kind of a throwaway ship part. It's placed by the blue onion. To reach it, Pikmin will have to build the stick. Just watch out below, there are several shear rigs underneath it. There is an annoying mechanic that will enable them to become invincible while eating a Pikmin, just like the shear grubs. To save said Pikmin, you'll have to throw a Pikmin right on top of its back. This can be surprisingly hard to do. Anyway, Olimar will say, I found the automatic gear. This thing chugs right along at its own pace. It makes piloting so much easier, giving me time to concentrate on the finer points of space travel. It has thin cracks running through it. I tried to fill them with dirt. I hope it'll be alright. One thing that I just adore about the Force Naval is all the weird creatures that live here. My favorite is the Puff Stool. This guy is a giant mushroom monster though. Turn your Pikmin into mushroom Pikmin. It's way too easy to kill, unfortunately. You can easily one-cycle this creature before it can even turn your Pikmin into mushroom Pikmin. You have to flip it over and reveal its weak side. It'll drop the Omega Stabilizer. And all Marvel will say, I found the Omega Stabilizer. I absolutely must have this piece if my battered ship is ever to fly straight again. It has steered me through countless deep space storms. That, and it looks rather cool. This is the dolphin's fin. It is a little beaten up, but it should still function. I've made great strides in repairing the dolphin. With this, I should be able to fly again, even if I don't recover all 30 parts. Speaking of weird creatures, the beady longlegs is here. You have to blow up a stone wall with a bomb rock first. This guy is no joke. It has 5,000 HP, which is more than triple the amount that it has in Pikmin 2. It's easiest to use yellow Pikmin because its body is so up high, but you also could use red Pikmin for the extra attack power. Usually, this thing will step on a few of my Pikmin because the fight is just so long-winded. It'll drop the guard satellite. On a side note, I love when this part just floats alongside the ship. Anyway, Olimar will say, The guard satellite. Deep space is filled with dangers. This automatic satellite does its part to help guard both me and my spaceship. I'll sleep better at night once this little satellite is back on duty. This has protected me from space pirates many, many times. Remember when I said that the devs try to balance all three Pikmin types in this stage? That's what I love about the Libra. To get it, Olimar will have to bring all three Pikmin types. At least in theory. After navigating them through fire geysers, they'll have to build a bridge. After building the bridge, Olimar will have to throw yellow Pikmin up high. Then Blue Pikmin will have to break an underwater geyser. This will shoot Olimar up to the Yellow Pikmin, which he can throw even higher to grab the Libra. Olimar will state, I found my Libra. My daughter gave this to me. It's named after her astrological sign. My sweet little girl. I wonder what she's doing at this moment. My daughter gave this to me. My late return must have her very worried. Since we're talking about the Libra, I gotta mention the Libra glitch. The collision in Pikmin is jank. There aren't too many ship parts up high, so it makes sense that this was overlooked during development. The problem here is that the island that the Libra is on is surrounded by an abyss. If one is unlucky, the Libra can bounce right off the edge, and it will just disappear forever. The player can restart the day to make it reappear again, but if the player accidentally saves after this, the game can't be completed. 
the Libra is a necessary ship part for Allmutter to survive. If the player goes along the fire geyser path a bit longer, they'll come across the analog computer. It's in water, so Blue Pikmin have to get it out. Technically, Blue Pikmin could take it back to the ship, but they'll probably get burned by the fire geysers. It really is just so much easier to have Red Pikmin carry it. All Marvel State, I found my analog computer. This computer conveys the kind of vague data that falls outside the range of ones and zeros. Actually, to be honest, it's a little bit too vague, so it isn't very helpful. This strengthens the outward emotions of the Dolphin's computer. While it does make the computer smart, it also makes it quick to anger. It's just like my boss. Speaking of shit parts of water, the anti-deoxin filter will be in a puddle that is near two woolly wogs. I guess if you're brave, you can just take the shit part without even interacting with them. I'm a pussy, so I just decide to fight them. These guys will fight by jumping up in the air and coming down hard, squishing any Pikmin that are caught underneath them. This damn ship part requires 40 Pikmin to lift it. Oh, Marvel State, it's the anti-deoxin filter. This fits over the rocket's exhaust port and filters out all the disease causing agents from the ship's exhaust. That means I'll be able to move around without polluting the planet's atmosphere. I feel worlds better. The laws of deep space requires all ships to eliminate all pollutants. The last ship part involves a bread bug. I love this little guy. It's so stupid looking that it's somehow cute. It will try to drag away pellets and enemy corpses. If enough Pikmin attempt to carry the object that the bread bug is holding, the Pikmin will overpower it. They will drag its ass all the way back to the onion. When the item goes into the onion, the bread bug will hit its head and receive massive damage. These guys can't be swarmed, but a Pikmin can be thrown on its back to deal some damage. The only way that he can kill Pikmin is by dragging the item back to its hole when the Pikmin are attached to the item. It will drop the space float when defeated. Thank goodness, my space float. This float is an absolute necessity for any pilot who lacks skill at swimming in space. An excellent swimmer like me has no need for something like this, but my motto is, always be prepared. Really, it's just for emergencies. Well, that's all the ship parts. But there are some other things I want to cover before moving on. First of all, the music track, it slaps. It's not quite as good as the Forest of Hope, but goddamn is it up there. I also love how there are red and yellow candy pop buds here. If the player throws a Pikmin into a candy pop bud, it'll spit out the same number of seeds that match the flower's color. I never really use them here, but I do use them in the distant spring. There are sheer wigs and sheer grubs scattered throughout the stage. These guys can be a huge pain if one isn't expecting them. A couple of iridescent flip beetles can be found here as well. Just be careful. Careful. These ones love to run in the water, which can cause some drownings. Between these enemies like the Fiery Blowhogs, Puffstool, and Woolywogs, I'd say that the enemy variety here is pretty damn good. It even has a boss in the form of Beady Longlegs. The Force Naval is a very memorable stage, and it honestly may be my favorite. Another interesting thing to note is all of the geysers and sticks that don't seem to do anything. Like, look at this geyser here. What benefit does this bring? You can easily walk around it and it doesn't take up any more time. There were a few of these near the base in particular. These have to be left over from demo versions of the stage, right? You can also fall off the sledge near the Libra. I did it once this playthrough by accident. Omar will just kind of be in limbo for a while, and if you're unlucky, he can be stuck for a very long time. Not before long, Omar teleported back to the stage for me. The last full-blown stage, the Distant Spring, has an eye-watering 10 ship parts, and is by far the hardest stage in the game. The enemies don't mess around here. Enemies like Smokey Prog and Bulbear can kill a lot of Pikmin in no time flat. Some of them, like the Puffy Blowhog and Swooping Stitch Bug, are just annoying as shit. There are also seven yellow woolly wogs, an armored cannon beetle, ten water dumples. There are just so many enemies. To make matters worse, a lot of the ship parts are in water, meaning that you're just gonna want to use blue Pikmin, which don't have the attack strength of red Pikmin. At least there are a few easy ship parts. For example, the repair type bolt is super easy to get. All that you have to do is throw a blue Pikmin up on the sledge and direct him to the ship part. Funnily enough, because it's up high, I've seen people try to use yellow Pikmin. Guess how that goes. Anyway, all Marvel say, I found the repair type bolt. This robotic Marvel can fix just about anything in the ship that's broken. That's good, because I get terribly bored fixing little glitches. This looks like an ordinary bolt, but it's actually repairable. Let me go on a little rant here. Blue Pikmin are dumb as shit. I swear, the paths that they take to the onion are just so goddamn stupid. Getting the massage machine displays this perfectly. For whatever reason, you have to build this bridge right here. There are a few shear rigs here, so watch out for those. If you make all Blue Pikmin carry the part, they will stop in front of the bridge if it's not built. For whatever reason, they simply refuse to enter water, even though that is their whole ability. Anyway, all Mar will say, I found my massage machine. Put this right down in the lower back area and let it go to work. I can't wait until I get this thing installed again, as my lower lumbar region has been paining me ever since the crash. Ah, sweet relief. I've been walking so much lately. I'm really looking forward to using this. Another ship part that abuses this logic is the gluon drive. You're supposed to build both of these bridges so that they can connect and the Pikmin can get the ship part across. Again, though, why can't blue Pikmin just go through the goddamn water? There are exploits to allow this, like carrying the Shearig corpses into it, which will push the gluon drive into the water, but it's still annoying. Not even just that, even with all the open space when the Pikmin get to the land, they will carry it right into the sleeping bulbears, which will wake them up. 
This part also requires 50 Pikmin. I hate this shit part. I found the Gluon Drive. Using the quark-biting metaphysical properties of gluons, this device... Well, it's very scientific, and I don't fully understand it myself, but it was very expensive. I have no idea how this works, but it means the dolphin will again lift off with this characteristic roar. Speaking of bull bears, I'm going to take a second to talk about them. There are six of them, and they are packing 1,300 hit points. You can try to swore them like the spotty bull borbs, but beware. Things can go horribly wrong. If they get an opening to attack, you may lose a lot of Pikmin. To make matters worse, some of them have dwarf bull bears by their side, starting on day 16. They can shriek to wake up their parents just like dwarf bulbars. Or at least that's what the Pikipedia says. I think I may be going insane, but I can't get these guys to shriek in story mode. I can get them to shriek in challenge mode to wake up spotty bulbars, but still not spotty bulbars. Some of these guys are near a puffy bullhog as well. The puffy bullhog is so annoying to kill in this game, they keep floating away from you as you desperately try to throw Pikmin on them. They don't necessarily kill Pikmin, but they can blow a huge gust of air at them, which will scatter them all. Speaking of annoying, the Snoopy Snitchbug is such a douchebag. This asshole flies around and picks Pikmin from your army and plants them somewhere else. It hasn't really come up until now, but I would advise killing as many sheer grubs and sheer wigs as you can. These assholes will munch on bridges, shortening them. This means that the player will have to go back to the bridges and complete them again. Remember when I said that there was a lot of water in this stage? Well, one of the ship parts, the interstellar radio, can be found deep in the water. A puffy blowhog will have it, but it'll be surrounded by three water dumples. The best method is to try to lure one of them away and fight it on its own, as it can gobble up multiple Pikmin at once. Fighting all three of them, as well as the puffy blowhog at once, can be a nightmare. Anyway, Olimar will say, I found my interstellar radio. Not only does it emit a constant SOS signal, it also broadcasts voices from space that will brighten up my moments of boredom. The dolphin, while comfortable, becomes quite a lonely place in the depths of the night. This part will send out a daily SOS signal. I have so little time remaining, though, that I have no option but to continue my search rather than waiting for a rescue party. Having to collect every part is a bit overwhelming, but I get the impression that not all parts are needed to fly the ship. One thing that I failed to mention is that there are a couple of reinforced walls here. This means that it's nice to take out about 15 yellow Pikmin or so and leave them on land while doing the other stuff for the blue Pikmin in water. Their bomb racks will be helpful against enemies here too. They can also grab the UV lamp. This can be done by destroying the dark reinforced wall right next to the base. It's a good idea to kill these bull bears here as well as this douchebag puffy blowhog as they are right in the way. To get to the UV lamp, the player will have to direct yellow Pikmin through a maze. Ship parts like this can show off how finicky Pikmin movement is in small spaces. Luckily, the ship part only needs 10 Pikmin to carry it. Omar will say, I found my UV lamp. The only problem with this handheld light is that it can be too bright at times. I have to remember to wear my sun visor whenever I look into it. This handy light is great for tanning, but it doesn't seem to have any relation to the dolphin's flight capabilities. I doubt that it will affect my escape from this planet. Perhaps there are other ship parts like this as well. If the player goes on a bit further, they can find the number 2 Ionium jet. There really isn't much to say about this one. The player will have to throw Pikmin up on the ledge and then use the geyser to get up there themselves. Just be careful the water dumples here. The blue Pikmin will actually avoid the spotty bull bears for once though. They'll take the ship parts through the puddles behind the sleeping beast. All Marvel will say, I found my number 2 Ionium jet. It's easy on the eyes and its fuel efficiency is easy on the budget. The answer to these jets boasts that, with excellent mileage that's easy on the family budget, this will keep your wife smiling and propel you to a happy home life. The intended way to get the Kronos Reactor is really cool. It's right next to the number 2 Ionium jet. The player will have to throw a blue Pikmin on top of the sledge. Omer can get up by using a geyser. The player will have to turn at least 20 blue Pikmin into yellow Pikmin with the golden candy pop button. The player can then throw the yellow Pikmin high enough to grab it. The player can turn them back into blue Pikmin with the lapis lazuli candy pop button. If they don't, the yellow Pikmin are pretty much just stranded on the island. Olimar will say, I found my Kronos Reactor. Using strange new technology, this machine is able to warp the space-time continuum and turn it into energy. I am constantly amazed at how many mysteries are locked inside the parts of my ship. This reactor changes permutations in the space-time continuum into pure energy. Basically, it's like a big rubber band. It should be noted that you can just cheese this completely. The player can just throw 20 blue Pikmin on the sledge here. After that, they can lure one of the bull bears over to try to attack Olimar. If the player's timing is perfect, they can clip on top of the bull bear when it goes down for a bite, and Olimar will end up on the ledge. Then they can just walk right on over to the Kronos Reactor. It's commonly used in speedruns, but my skill level is ass and I just cannot do this to save my life. The pilot seat is nearby, and unfortunately, this is another nothing ship part. Sure, there are annoying ass yellow woolly wogs and shear rigs in the way, but there's nothing really to say on this one. And why the hell is this considered a necessary ship part? Omar will say, At last, my pilot seat. Once I get this installed, my cockpit will finally be back in order. Soon, my ship will be starting to look more and more like the dolphin of old. Ah, the memories. Picturing this in the cockpit, images of me lifting off into space begin to fill my taxed brain. It fills me with inspiration once again. The zirconium rotor is nearby and has a bit more going on. It is advised to break down this reinforced wall with yellow Pikmin to open up a faster carry route. If this wall isn't torn down, the Pikmin may find an alternate route, but it takes forever. The ship part is behind a bramble wall. Just be careful of the yellow woolly wogs nearby. 
Allmar will say, It's my zirconium rotor. This is made from rust-proof zirconium, which is particularly suited to making spaceship parts. I had to pay a lot extra to have this installed, and I suspect that the mechanic overcharged me. Made of rust-proof zirconium, it is as shiny as new, despite being left out on this planet's harsh elements. There's only one more ship part to go. Getting to it can be a little scary, as the devs decide to put some fire geysers nearby. I just use blue Pikmin, because I don't think it's worth the time to haul around red Pikmin. A rematch against the armored cannon beetle will commence. As far as I know, the fight is virtually the same as it was in the Forest of Hope. To get the bow spurt back to the ship, the player have to build a slanted bridge as well as knock down a bramble wall. It's nice to kill these shithead shearwigs too. Almar will say, I've discovered the bow spurt. With this piece installed, my ship should regain some of its sleek shape. The so-called face of the dolphin. In point of fact, I designed it. I love the musical track here. It gives an uneasy sort of feeling, which makes sense as this is the final full stage. As I said before, there are plenty of vile beasts here, ranging from yellow woolly wogs to bull bears to water dumbles to the armored cannon beetle. Even if there aren't some necessarily vicious creatures, ones like the puffy blowhog and swooping snitch bug are incredibly annoying to deal with. Shearwigs can also eat bridges that you built. We saved the best one for last, though. There is one creature that is so powerful that it only appears once in the entire game. It only appears before day 16. This creature is totally optional, and I personally believe the devs did this because it would piss off new players. Near the interstellar radio, the player might notice an egg sitting on an island. If the player touches or attacks the egg, but does not deplete all of its health, a weird creature will emerge from the egg. If the player depletes the egg's health, nothing will hatch. Funnily enough, it will ignore Olimar. It will do something that is debatably worse. It will head right towards the SS Dolphin and just camp there. The player should notice a trail of poison following the creature. If any Pikmin touches that trail, they will instantly die. This guy can also uproot sprouted Pikmin. The only way to deal with this guy is to throw Pikmin right at its face. This creature moves around quickly, and combine that with bad Pikmin AI, it is very hard to no death run this guy. On top of that, it will also restore a bit of health over time. This creature's name is the Smoky Prong. It's packing 4,000 health, making it one of the tankiest creatures in the game. Combine this with his impressive ability to just slaughter a horde of Pikmin, and things can get bad pretty quickly. Again, it should be noted this guy is completely optional. When defeated, it'll drop a golden pearl. This will generate 100 Pikmin. That's pretty much the distant spring. On to the final stage in the game. We are finally at the final trial, the final stage in the game, and it only has a single ship part. Getting there is pretty fun. The devs intended the player to use all the Pikmin types, but what is that ever the case? The blue Pikmin will have to build two bridges, the yellow Pikmin will need to use bomb rocks on the reinforced wall in the center, and the red Pikmin will need to push this box that is behind some fire. When the player knocks down the Bramble Gate, they'll see a giant mass in the center. When approached, the Emperor Bulblax will reveal itself. This bad boy has 30,000 HP, which gives it the highest HP stat in the game. Fine, I guess it's tied with the Gulix, oddly enough. I, I didn't know that before doing this video. A giant, badass Bulborb that'll gobble a Pikmin in no time flat. One thing to notice is that its backside is armored. Unlike other Bulborbs. This means that going around this guy? No, 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 that's not gonna work. This isn't the way to win. You're gonna have to attack its face. The intended way to beat the boss is by sending out yellow Pikmin with bomb rocks. When the Emperor Bulbax goes to eat them, the yellow Pikmin should, keyword being should, throw the bomb rock into its mouth. If the timing is perfect, the Emperor Bulbax will hit himself in the face with his own tongue, which will stun him for a decent period of time. If the player can't get the timing just right, they can always sacrifice the yellow Pikmin holding bomb rocks too. While he is stunned, it's time to throw Pikmin right onto its face. Eating isn't the only thing that it could do to Pikmin though. It'll start to jump around the battlefield when it hits half health. If you're not expecting this, shit can end so badly. 30,000 HP later, the beast goes down. It's unfortunate that you don't get to carry its body back. It will drop five, five, pellets for you. But I really wanted to see the Pikmin haul away this massive beast. When defeated, it will drop the secret safe, the final ship part in the game. Collecting the piece will automatically end the game. Omar will say, At long last, I found the final part, my secret safe, and it's as full as ever. How glad I am that I've persisted in my search without losing hope. Now I can leave this planet without any regrets. Maybe I'll even stop and pick up some souvenirs for my wife and kids back on planet Hokitate. At last, I have found it, my most prized possession. I am so relieved, it's as heavy as ever. There's not too much else to say about the final trial. All three types of candy pop buds are right by the base in case the player is low on a specific type of Pikmin. I remember back in the day, it took a full day to unlock the boss area, and a full day to beat the Emperor Bulblax itself. If you know what you're doing, all this is easily doable in a single day. In the shocking turn of events, the musical track here is another banger. I swear, Pikmin's OST is one of my favorites in all of gaming. It is just so good. After the secret safe has been collected, the good ending will commence. I already talked about it above, so I won't go into too much detail here. After that, the credits roll, and the player will also get a look at the enemy reel. This will show off the 27 enemies in the game, and all more give his thoughts on each one. I love how these were recorded earlier in the game's development. We can see creatures where they don't actually appear in the main game. 
The best example is the Gulix appearing in the Forest Naval. There is a whole list of discrepancies on the Picopedia if one is curious. Luckily, there are some side content to Pikmin, but it ain't much. Challenge mode is a nice chill mode where the player can see how many Pikmin they can grow in a single day. It features the five same stages as the story mode, but they'll be remixed. The day duration is different from the story mode too. The impact site is shorter, the final trial is the same length, while the other three stages are longer. I'll go over them briefly. The impact site features very few enemies. There is a bread bug, as well as an iridescent flint beetle. This may make it sound boring, but getting the maximum score here is actually pretty difficult. For starters, the in-game daytime is only 10 minutes and 48 seconds. Another thing to keep in mind is pellets get more Pikmin when it's brought to the same colored onion. You also have to hit the flint beetle a certain amount of times to get all pellets from it. The maximum score is 278, and as you can see, I was nowhere close to that shit. The Forest of Hope is one of the more interesting ones. There are several enemies, such as Spotty and Dwarf Bull Borbs, Spotty and Dwarf Bull Bears, and a Pearly Clam Clam. It's so cool to see something like the Pearly Clam Clam appears outside of their story area. The time given here is 18 minutes and 54 seconds. The maximum score that can be achieved here is 569. This is where I experimented with the Shrieking Dwarf Bull Bear. I can't tell if I'm doing something wrong or if the Picopedia is wrong. It will wake up the Spotty Bull Borb, but not the Spotty Bull Bear. The Forest Naval is similar to the Impact Site in the way that there are very few enemies here. There is a bread bug and a pearly clamp clamp, and that is pretty much it. Other than that, the player will have to try to return all the pellets around the stage to the correct onion. The highest score one can achieve is 482, and they have 16 minutes and 12 seconds to do that. The main challenge here is exploring the entire area in time and getting those pellets back to the correct onion. The Distant Spring is by far the hardest stage to get a perfect score in. In fact, it hasn't been done by an actual human player yet. The highest theoretical score is 752, but the highest that a human player has gotten is 728. The reason for this? Well, this stage is just simply too big, and there are way too many enemies. The enemies will also drop colored pellets, and it can be difficult to make sure that every single pellet is brought back to the correct onion. The game will give the player 18 minutes and 54 seconds. As for the enemies, there are some neat ones here. There are two puff stools, which is very cool. They seem like such an underused enemy in the main game. There are three pearly clam clams, which again, seem like another underused enemy in the main story. There are a shit ton of dwarf bull borbs and yellow woolly wogs. A mamuda appears here too, which is cool to see in a different spot than the impact. Site. I think this one may be my favorite challenge level due to its difficulty, as well as its diverse enemy pool. The final trial has a different trick up its sleeve. Instead of having to grow your army of Pikmin right off the bat, the game will play 100 seeds around the map that the player will have to find. There are a couple of enemies here. There are four dwarf bull borbs, a dwarf bull bear, and a yellow woolly wog. Enough of that though, what's in the boss area? You guessed it, the beady long legs. Just like in story mode, this guy is no joke. Keep in mind that when your Pikmin die, your score will decrease. There's also a burrowing snaggard above the boss area, just for good measure, I guess. The player will have 13 minutes and 30 seconds to complete the stage, which is a normal day's length. The highest number of obtainable Pikmin here is 299. Challenge mode is a nice cozy mode to return to every once in a while, but it's never been a big draw for me personally. I like how they tried to give the area some variety, spicing them up with new enemies and time limits. Overall, I'm happy that it's included, and it certainly helps make Pikmin a better overall package, because again, let's be real, Pikmin is short as hell, and it was a full price game back in the day. If challenge mode wasn't here, it would be even lighter on content. So, that's all the gameplay modes covered. But let's get into some other things that I just love about Pikmin. I love the game structure in general. The day length of 13 and a half minutes is just near perfection. The allocated time is enough that it feels like you can get a lot done in a single day. At the same time though, it's short enough that it has that one more day syndrome. On top of that, if one screws up and wants to restart the day, it's not that big of a hassle either due to their shorter length. I touched on it briefly before, but lowering the amount of days you need to collect everything is just so satisfying. Trying to find a new route to get all ship parts quicker just feels so goddamn good. When I was younger, the game took me roughly 20 in-game days or so to beat. I think my record's 10 now, but I can easily push that down to 9 or 8 with some better strats. Due to the game being very short, it's also uber replayable. Like, I play this game multiple times a year replayable. The player has to make so many decisions while playing Pikmin, and I think many don't even notice this. Like, how much time should you take to grow Pikmin? If you have more Pikmin, more stuff can get done, but how many is enough? What enemies should you take the time to kill? During speedruns, you'll notice that the player only kills certain enemies. Are flower Pikmin worth getting? They are faster than other Pikmin, sure, but it takes time to pluck nectar weeds and actually obtain them. What optional walls are worth destroying? Is it better to hold on to bomb racks for tougher enemies, or do you just want to destroy the dark bramble walls? Pikmin is one of those games that makes my mind run at a million miles per hour. I'm always debating what I should do next. What action will save me the most amount of time? How many Pikmin should I assign to each task? Should I grab a ship part now or loop back to it later when I have more Pikmin present? When more Pikmin carry an object, they'll go faster. Is it worth having those Pikmin get the ship part back quicker? Or should I multitask and have them do something else? I love the adrenaline rush, man. It's so goddamn good. I briefly mentioned it earlier, but please look up both speed runs and six day runs if you have the time. The exploits that they perform in this stuff is just things that I never would have thought of. The fact that they can outright skip the Kronos Reactor puzzle is awesome. It's a 
a cool idea in theory, but in practice, this ship part takes forever to actually obtain correctly. Another funny one is skipping the second bridge and retrieving the gluon drive. Using the sheer reed carcasses, the player can just push the gluon drive into the water, and the blue Pikmin will have no choice but to skip the second bridge. It's not just the exploits, though. It's the decision-making and Pikmin handling that really make my jaw drop. Even something as simple as swarming all the Pikmin perfectly around enemies makes me surprised. Seeing all these people can just master every single technique and map out the perfect run is insane! The fact that all the stages besides the impact site can be done in just a single day is just wild to me. I can do the harder stages like the Distant Spring and Forest Naval in two days, sure, but one? That's just crazy to see. Please! If you're a hardcore Pikmin fan but haven't taken the time to look into speedruns of the game, please do! You will not be disappointed. The enemy designs are just so much fun. If you include the candy pop buds, there are roughly 26 enemies total, and I'd like the balance between goofy but dangerous. The count may be off for some people because people like to split up the three candy pop buds, some like to include the Puffman, some like to include or not include harmless ones like the Honey Wisp. There's some decent variety here in the enemies. A lot of them will just eat Pikmin as their form of attack, but they all have their varying degrees of health, spawns, interactions. For example, the sheer wigs and grubs will eat your bridges and take damage from water. Those assholes. They also have the deadly glitch bite that I described earlier. Compare that to a regular ass dwarf bulborb. They could shake off Pikmin, eat Pikmin, and wake up a spotty bulborb with a shriek. I love how these guys are awake and alert at all times while the spotty bulborb is sleeping. This means that you can take the time that you need and walk around it and plan an attack. Speaking of that, I love how the distant spring ditches the spotty bulborbs and brings in the tougher units, the spotty bull bears. They have 700 more health that can be difficult to take them down without any losses. Who can forget the snagrit? It acts so quickly in this game. The way they can just quickly nip a few Pikmin ahead underground, this can lead to a lot of Pikmin deaths. The Pearly Clam Clamp has the ability to eat so many Pikmin at one time. Even though you could sum up a lot of enemies as, they eat Pikmin. They all have so many nuances about them. What about monsters that don't eat Pikmin? Well, you have the Wooly Wogs that'll jump up in the air and come crashing down with full force. Any Pikmin caught underneath these guys will perish. What about the Armored Cannon Beetle? This guy will try to fly in Pikmin with boulders. Fun fact, these boulders can be used to crush enemies. I knew about this trick in Pikmin 2 with the cannon beetle larva, but I didn't know that it worked in this game as well. Omar can also punch the boulder to make it explode. Two enemies will use elemental hazards to try to kill Pikmin. The Gulags will try to suffocate Pikmin with water, while the fiery bullhog will shoot out streams of fire. This is an idea that was explored more in Pikmin 2 with the addition of electricity and poison. Sure, some enemies like the water dumple and woolly wogs will hang out in water, but the two above are the only ones to actually use the hazards themselves. Some enemies are just so annoying. The puffy bullhog will make Pikmin go flying everywhere if they blow a gust of air on them. The Swoosh Snitch will go fly around the entire map and take Pikmin from your squad just to plant them elsewhere. The Pikmin can be thrown in water, so I guess it can indirectly kill Pikmin. The Bread Bug can be a pain to track down if you picked up all the pellets around the map already. At that point, your best bet is to try to throw Pikmin on its back. There are a few enemies who are mostly harmless. The female Shear Grubs are honestly adorable, but they eat bridges so they must die. The Mamuda will only plant Pikmin, but it won't necessarily kill them in any way. They'll turn them into flower Pikmin, but this could still be irritating. The Iridescent Flint Beetle might attract Pikmin toward danger, but they can't can't hurt the Pikmin themselves. They'll drop goodies for the player if they can land a Pikmin on them. The Honey Wisp will drop a blob of nectar if they are hit in the air. Then you have the stupid wog poles that pretty much don't do anything. One thing that I just love about Pikmin 1 is the fact that the bosses feel menacing and they feel like a genuine threat. The beady long legs just take so long to kill in this game. I honestly don't think I've killed this guy once without losing at least one Pikmin. The Pikmin love to go after its feet, which will usually get them stomped on. It will also shake off Pikmin that are on its body, which will cause them to go flying all around the battlefield. Another neat thing about Beady is that it gets its own battle music. It really adds to the tension. At first, you're just vibing to the Forest Neville's music track. Then it changes to this menacing tune. The Smoky Prog is just such an awesome hidden enemy. The way they can demolish Pikmin is nearly unmatched. The idea that it's thought to be a malformed larval Mamuda is just so interesting. I love how Pikmin isn't afraid to scare off players with big, brutal fights. I remember this guy killing so many of my Pikmin back in the day. Watching new players fight this thing is always such a treat. Please don't try to swarm this guy. It will not end well. The Puff Stool is one of my favorite enemies. A giant ass mushroom thing that just looks so goofy. If you know what you're doing, it's a non-threat. In fact, you can one-cycle this guy pretty easily. However, if you want to flip back over, it will release spores all turn nearby Pikmin into Mushroom Pikmin. These guys will attack Olimar and other Pikmin if they get too close. Of course. I also got to mention the glitch that allows Olimar to command Mushroom Pikmin. If Olimar uses the whistle right before the Puff Stool releases its spores, the Pikmin will get hit by the spores but return to Olimar anyway. Olimar can swarm them to pick up objects, fight enemies, and other basic tasks. When said task is completed, they'll turn back into their original color. The Mushroom Pikmin will be immune to the hazard that the original color was too. It's a fun glitch. But there's no practicality to it. Call me basic, but the Emperor Bulblax is easily my favorite final boss in the series from a creature design standpoint. I love taking the basic enemy of the game, the Bulborb, and just decking it out completely. This guy has an armored back, the capacity to eat several Pikmin at once, and a jump attack and then catch players off guard. That's not to mention the size of this guy. He is ridiculously big. 
which adds to the intimidation factor. I love the use of bomb rocks here as well. It makes the fight stand out against others in the game, like BD Longlegs. The Emperor of Bulblags gets its own battle theme as well, and it's even more epic. Speaking of battle themes, the OST of Pikmin is simply one of my favorites in all of gaming. Each of the five stages all have killer themes and they're all dynamic. Each of the five stages have a main theme, a battle theme, a ninth theme, and a ninth theme while in battle too. It's not just those. The end of day theme, the stage selection screen, the file selection screen, the challenge mode screen, when Olimar is writing his daily log. It is just goddamn banger after banger after banger. That's not to mention all the little jingles too, like discovering a new Pikmin type, discovering a new onion, bringing back a shit part to the SS Dolphin, when the SS Dolphin range increases. Increases. Pikmin is just a game that sounds beautiful at pretty much every moment. The Pikmin themselves are adorable. I get that Pikmin is an RTS series, which can be a hard sell for a lot of people, but I'm surprised that the Pikmin themselves aren't marketing juggernauts by now. There's so many different types, and there should be plushies and action figures of them everywhere. The way they look, the sounds they make, the way they get thrown everywhere. They are just so cute. I love their little traits that differentiate them too. My favorite might be the blue Pikmin gills. The pointy nose on the red Pikmin isn't bad either. I'm less partial to the ears on yellow Pikmin, but they are still cute enough. Letting the Pikmin die is so sad. I know that I shouldn't care, they are just a digital number after all. The thought of letting one drown, get eaten, burn to death, get stomped on, it makes my heart churn. I do my best, but some of these enemies are just too much for me. The Snagger is one that immediately comes to mind. I'm too awful at the game to do a no death run, but hey, maybe someday. Having said that though, there are certain situations where I'll just let the Pikmin die if I can go faster. I love the Pikmin with all my heart, but I also love completing Pikmin as fast as I can. It's a stupid moral dilemma that I shouldn't have, but I have it anyway. Olimar is one of my favorite protagonists ever. He is pretty much how I'd write one for a video game. It's all side stuff. His diary entries aren't necessary to read, and that's great if you just want to rush through the game. If you take a second and stop and read these though, Olimar is an amazing character. We get to hear him about missing his family, see his emotions fluctuate between hopeful and hopeless, and these can even act as mini tutorials that cover enemies and control schemes. In general, the narrative of Pikmin 1 is easily the best in the franchise and it ain't close to be honest with you. I love how the control schemes and tutorials are all done via Olimar's thoughts. You are Olimar. You are the one that is trying to round up the ship parts. You are the one that is going to die in 30 days if you can't get the 25 necessary ship parts. I love how the collectibles play into the story as well. Some of these entries are humorous too. Despite some of these being needed technically, some of them don't seem to be. Judging by the descriptions, the Libra, Extraordinary Bolt, Pilot Seat, Bowsprit, Sagittarius, among a few others, really shouldn't be needed. It may just be a humorous bit. Some of them, like the Positron Generator, really shows off how funny this game can be at times. Speaking of needed ship parts, the Nova Blaster, Space Float, Secret Safe, UV Lamp, and Massage Machine are not needed. I love how this game gives the player some breathing room, even if getting a ship part a day is extremely doable. So, I've gushed about Pikmin long enough, but let's be real here. There are some truly annoying things about this game. For me, the big one-two punch is the Pikmin AI and the game's engine. Pikmin will consistently leave your squad to do dumb shit. You know, pluck weeds, attack enemies, carry corpses, attack geysers, and the worst one of them all, trip. This shit is goddamn annoying. It really is such a pain in the ass when you've done all the math in your head, plan out your day to a T, and then have some Pikmin just leave your group. It's usually easy to notice, but there is nothing more infuriating than checking your map and seeing some Pikmin got stuck behind a wall or something. The tripping, man. It's just so stupid. It's dumb in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, and it's dumb here. It happens so often, too. And it's really annoying when it happens when fleeing an enemy or something. To my knowledge, tripping is random. I decided to look on the Pikipedia, and there it states that the reason for tripping is unknown. There's a room that swarming will cause the trip percentage to go up, but that's not 100% confirmed. You could quickly disband your squad and call them back to make the trip Pikmin get up faster, but that's still a pain. Pikmin can still trip in Pikmin 2, but they made this less common. They removed it altogether in Pikmin 3. Thank you, Pikmin 3. If we're talking about the game's engine, I have three words for you. The crushing glitch. This shit is dumb. Basically, if an object collides with a Pikmin in an awkward way, the Pikmin will be pushed underneath the terrain and they will perish. At one point in time, this actually looked intentional. In the Pikmin Alpha trailer from Space World 2001, a yellow woolly walks course can be seen crushing Pikmin. Wait, you can also pluck Pikmin with the whistle? Why was that taken out? This is different though. As you can see, the Pikmin that got crushed by the Wooly Wog's corpse revealed ghosts. In the final release, that doesn't happen. People have hacked the camera and shown that Pikmin simply clip out of bounds and they fall into the void. It is total bullshit and I hate it. I guess one could argue that it adds to the skill level of the game, but it's in a frustrating way, you know? Some other smaller things still pop up. For example, the throwing speed is slow as shit. You can always swarm throw though, which adds a bit of mechanical skill, but I argue that it shouldn't be necessary in the first place. Pikmin sprouts take forever to actually become pluckable. There's a slight delay on the whistle, which can lead to some very frustrating Pikmin deaths. You can't change Pikmin in Olimar's hand, and the method of throwing is quite questionable. When you grab a red Pikmin, the other red Pikmin will be next in line. 
This makes perfect sense on paper. In practice, though, other Pikmin will keep getting in the way, and you'll find yourself throwing other types in tight corners. It gets very frustrating in big battles. You also can't skip the end-of-day cutscene, so after every single day, you'll be treated to this cutscene. Don't get me wrong, it's cute and all that, I love the little jingle, but you really should be able to skip it. Omar will state that 100 Pikmin can't be on the field numerous times per play session. It gets ridiculous at points. I swear, he pretty much said it every single day in my last run. Another complaint is the fact that the game lacks meaningful side content. Let's be real here. Pikmin is short as hell. If someone played for all 30 days and didn't end any of them early, the playtime would only be around 6.75 hours. I talked a bit about challenge mode already. It adds a bit of content. I'm definitely glad it's here, but it's the only form of side content. I can see many people being miffed with the game, especially back in the day. This costs full price, and it is so light on content. Don't get me wrong. For a freak like me that has played this upon dozens upon dozens of times, this was worth the price of admission. I totally get the bang for your buck argument. So, that's Pikmin. A game that I simply adore. I simply couldn't imagine my life without this g What do you mean there's a Wii port? God damn it! Pikmin was ported to the Wii as a part of the new Play Control series. In fact, it was the second one released after Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. If we're talking pure gameplay, this is my favorite way to play, full stop. Playing with the Wii mode is just so goddamn satisfying. We can also move the cursor without Olimar now. On top of that, the cursor goes really far. Some of those terrifying throws in the original version? Those are a piece of cake now. The whistle will go even further than that, too. Besides the obvious control change, there are a few others that are worth mentioning. My favorite one is switching Pikmin and Olimar's hands before he throws them. This was initially added in Pikmin 2, so it's nice to see that they added it for this. Bomb Rock Pikmin counts as their own group, which is great. An updated save system allows the player to restart play from any previous day in the save file. This is awesome for a game like Pikmin! It is so focused on replayability and bettering yourself, Pikmin lasts longer while they are on fire or drowning. It was only like a second and a half in the GameCube version. Basically, if a horde got burned, some would definitely die. These are all positive changes, right? Well, there are two main reasons why I go back and forth between this and the GameCube version. The first one is how they changed Bomb Rock Pikmin. In the GameCube version, when the Bomb Rock Pikmin was thrown away from an enemy or wall, they would just sit there. If the player whistled them back, they would drop the Bomb Rocks. In the new play control port, they keep the Bomb Rocks and return to Olimar. To be clear, the Pikmin can keep the Bomb Rocks in the GameCube version, but Olimar has to bump into them physically and not whistle them. I get why they did this. The GameCube method can lead to unwanted deaths of less experienced players. I've seen this scenario play out so many times on social media. There are some negative consequences that come from changing this, though. For example, how do you dispose of a bomb rock? You either have to find an enemy or wall to waste it on, put your yellow Pikmin back in the onion, or toss them in water because bomb rocks dissolve in water. Keep in mind, bomb rock Pikmin cannot help carry objects, or really do any other tasks for that matter, and it's really annoying to be short a Pikmin or two while you have some bomb rock Pikmin with you. The Pikmin AI is just so hilariously bad in this game, and this extends to bomb rock Pikmin. I've had plenty of yellow Pikmin waste bomb rocks, and it's just so goddamn frustrating. Sometimes it's just easier to throw the Pikmin right next to the enemy and call them back, but you can't do this in the new play control port. Some people actually love this change and say that it has saved them a lot of Pikmin. I'm not one of them. This is not an objective downgrade, it really comes down to taste. The other one. And you're probably not going to believe this. The crushing glitch seems even more prevalent! It's most noticeable when you fight a giant bull bear, yellow woolly wog, and the puff stool. You can see the Pikmin literally fall through the damn ground while you fight the damn yellow woolly wog. To be fair, I haven't found hard ass evidence that this is the case, but looking around the Pikmin fandom, many agree with me. The crushing glitch just seems so much more common for some reason. There are some other little nitpicks with this port. Swarm throwing is more difficult, which would be fine if they updated the throw speed. Guess what they didn't do? I miss being able to throw Pikmin Razor fast. Some fights, like the Emperor Bulbax and Beanie Longlegs, they are just so much easier in the GameCube version of me. Some sound effects are also... off. Woolywogs jumping, Bulborbs snoring, creatures dying. They all have higher pitched noises to them, and it just sounds weird to me. It's a shame. If the crunching glitch was subdued and the bomb rocks worked as they did in the original, I'd say that the Wii version is my favorite. Full stop. It really changes the way how you play Pikmin. Being able to throw and call them from farther away is just so great. Being able to move the cursor independently from Olimar is amazing. Being able to restart your save from any day is such a cool idea. I love the Wii version, and if you're a Pikmin veteran that has never had the chance, I'd say at least look into it. Physical copies are pretty cheap. This is when I would say you could buy it on Wii U, but Nintendo sucks asshole and disabled the eShop on the Wii U. So, that is Pikmin. A game that I simply adore. I couldn't imagine my... What do you mean there's a Switch port? God damn it! Remember when Nintendo Shadow Drop both Pikmin 1 and 2 for Switch during that Nintendo Direct on June 21st, 2023? Good times. I was kind of hoping for a full-on remake of Pikmin. Don't get me wrong, I obviously love the game to death, but it definitely has that rough-around-the-edges feel that most first-entry games in long-running series have. 
I was so ecstatic to see this, though. That meant that the whole mainline Pikmin series is available on Switch. Enough about that, though. What did they actually change? It should be noted that this is based off the new play control version of Pikmin, but it keeps the GameCube's cursor. This means that the nice enhancements of the Wii version are still intact. Omar can change Pikmin types in his hand before throwing them, it features the same save system that the Wii version did, Omar's silhouette will be colored, Pikmin Ghost will match the color of Pikmin that actually died, the game is in full screen, and the bomb rack system is how it was in the Wii version. There are a few key differences, though. For starters, they decided to use the GameCube version's cursor. To be clear, there are gyro capabilities in the game, but they are only active while throwing or whistling Pikmin. I don't really like this. I gave it a chance, but I decided to go back to the standard controls. Maybe I'm just picky after the Wii version, but the gyro just didn't feel right to me. Another thing to note is that the cursor is that it goes a decent bit further than the GameCube one at least. Some of those scary throws, like the one to the island with the Kronos reactor, those are much easier in this version than the GameCube one. They made the crushing glitch much less prevalent. Wait, hold the goddamn phone, they did what? The crushing glitch isn't gone altogether, but holy shit, this makes such a goddamn difference. Most Pikmin deaths truly feel like they're your own fault now. Sure, some BS ones are still there, like the Sheer Grub's death bite, but this is a great quality of life feature. The throwing speed has been increased dramatically, without the need to swarm throw. It's nice to see that Nintendo cared at least a little bit to clean up some issues with the game, but I wish they would have gone further. The graphics have been upscaled to 1080p when docked and 720p when playing in handheld, but the frame rate is still at 30 FPS. Pikmin starts to show his age a bit graphically here. Some of these textures are pretty goddamn bad. They updated the standby icons of the Pikmin, as well as Olimar's, which is cool, I guess. The enemy reel has been completely redone. It was cool seeing enemies in spots where they don't belong, but I'll live. There really isn't too much else to say about this port, honestly. It was a basic port. But now the question is, why isn't this one my favorite version? For starters, it uses the new play control bomb rock system, which I already stated my gripes with earlier. This is a bit more irritating than the Wii version because I have the GameCube cursor right there, damn it! It confuses me at times. This can be clear when fighting the Emperor Bullblax. That boss was designed with the original bomb rock method in mind. Again, if you prefer the way that it handled in the Wii version, you may even look at this as a positive. The second main problem here is the control method itself. I firmly believe that they should have had more control options. It's like they went out of their way to make sure that the GameCube controller couldn't be used comfortably. This is a missed opportunity, especially with the GameCube controller adapter being a thing. I still think that the GameCube controls are great, and this is after using the Wii remote. Some decisions here are honestly just baffling. Like the swarm, you have to hold on the L button and then use the second stick? This is because the second stick alone will control the camera. I don't think Pikmin needs a free camera to be honest. To lie down, the player has to push down on the right stick? I don't know. Maybe I'm just a bit more picky because I have that muscle memory down with the GameCube controller, but playing this just didn't feel right. If you want some really nitpicky shit, the attraction mode is gone. I miss that shit. Basically, if the player waited long enough at the title screen, four or five videos would play, depending on the version. These would show the player how to play the game. The musical track that accompanied this was also so much fun. I know, it's dumb. No one else cares, probably. Anyway, that's the Nintendo Switch version. It has its pros for sure. The crushing glitch is less common, the throwing speed has been increased, and the upscaling is nice. It's just too bad that the controls aren't my thing. I can see this being someone's favorite version just based on the throwing speed and crushing glitch alone. For 30 bones, it is a bit bare bones, but I don't regret my purchase. It's so nice to have all four mainline games on Switch now. That's not to mention, you can play them all portably now. Well, legally anyway. I may have tinkered around with them on Steam Deck a bit, but I still bought them to support the franchise. Are we done now? That's the last major port? Good. Pikmin is more than a game to me. Pikmin is a safe place. If I want the next two hours or so to be non-stop fun, Pikmin is always calling my name. Pikmin is such a cool franchise. Despite the advancements made in 2, 3, and 4, the first Pikmin will never be obsolete to me. Pikmin 2 added caves, which I know are divisive, but this completely changes the way you play the game. Pikmin 2 is nothing like Pikmin 1, and I'm honestly happy for it. Pikmin 3 decided to go back to the original game's roots, but it's still not really the same. They added rock and winged Pikmin, two extra captains, and the overall difficulty is much easier. It also loses a lot of the story and atmospheric punch that Pikmin 1 has. Pikmin 4 is the longest game in the franchise, which automatically doesn't make it like Pikmin 1. I still personally think that Pikmin 1 is easily the most replayable. Pikmin 2 is the one I play when I want to mess around in bullshit caves. Pikmin 3, especially Deluxe, is the one that I want to pick up when I want to multitask like a madman. The Gold Air feature? That is just seriously awesome. The Switch port adding multiplayer doesn't hurt either. Pikmin 4 is the one I want to play when I want a long-winded Pikmin adventure. I guess what I'm trying to say is... Well... Despite a few sequels objectively improving the gameplay in certain areas, looking at you, Pikmin AI. 
I still adore the first entry. To be honest, I still can't pick my favorite Pikmin game. Some days, Pikmin 1 is my favorite because it's the most replayable and that atmosphere is the best in the series and it ain't close. Sometimes I pick Pikmin 2 because I think the caves are an interesting addition. It forces the player to work on resource management rather than time management. Sometimes I pick Pikmin 3 Deluxe because multitasking, it is just the best feeling in that one. Sometimes it's Pikmin 4 because it does a great job of blending the previous three games. I still can't really pick. That is Pikmin 1, a game that I still adore over 20 years after its initial release. This is one of those few games that are more than just a game to me. It's a goddamn experience. I really hope that between Pikmin Blue, the Switch ports of 1 through 3, and Pikmin 4 coming out, more people get into Pikmin. It's a perfect blend of Nintendo's whimsical imagination and the dark truths about the circle of life. I'm going to play Pikmin until the day I die. What review score will I give it? It's gotta be a 7 out of 7, it simply has to be. No other score would make sense in my mind, despite its faults. What I said in my Pokemon Gold and Silver video about those games, it applies to Pikmin as well. When I say that I love video games, Pikmin is one of the very first that comes into my mind. If you want to get your hands on this game, the most ethical way to do it is to buy it on the Switch eShop. This is where I would plug the Wii U digital version too, but I can't do that now. Of course, something called Dolphin is a suitable alternative if you catch my drift, and that's admittedly how I captured much of this footage. If you have the GameCube controller adapter, it honestly feels like you're playing right on the GameCube. Hey, before we leave, I wanted to dedicate this video to my cat real quick. His name is Middens, and he tragically died sometime last year. Since Pikmin is one of my favorite games ever, and it's a game that reveals the brutally dark truths of life and death, I thought this was a great video to shout him out. I still miss you, buddy. I always will.